Miss Fire. Okay, so my name is Scott Chacon. This talk is a really long one, and then followed by another equally long one. So uh, we have two hours of introduction to Git. How many of you guys use Git today? How many of you guys do not use Git as your primary uh, SCM system today? Okay, so <clears throat> so that you know, going into this, this talk is going to be an introduction to Git. So. Um, if you have questions as I'm going, please do raise your hand and let me know, um, or shout it out, or throw something at me, as long as you don't hit me too hard with it, um, I think that'll be okay. Um, I'd be happy to answer it. So what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to go over how to use Git on sort of a step-by-step -step basis, and I'm going to be going over sort of how Git is working in the background as we go. So hopefully if you're already using Git, this will still be uh, interesting or useful to you. Um, if not, uh, if you're not using Git, hopefully it'll be a good primer. And then I'll leave you with some resources to, to follow up later to, to actually learn it when you can sit down on the computer and try everything out. Okay, so real fast, who I am. Uh, my name is Scott Cohn. I work at GitHub, um, which is a, a Git hosting company. Um, uh, Git SEM is the sort of official Git homepage. Uh, I maintain and design the site, so if there's anything wrong with it, you have only me to blame, and uh, I am more than happy to accept pull requests for new features and whatnot. Um, but you can go there to download Git and to look for documentation and, and stuff like that. So um, another site that I did is gitref.org, and this is a Git reference site. So basically all the commands that I'm going to be going over today, Git, does everybody, am I speaking too fast? How many? Is it okay? Um, I just, I just went to a conference in Brazil and I gave a talk like this and they had simultaneous translations and I thought I was going to get jumped by the translators after. Um, so if you go to this site after this talk, if, if I'm going over any of this stuff too fast um, as I'm teaching it, you can go to this site and you can click on any of these commands. I, I'm sort of grouping them by um, what you use them for uh, in Git. And then you can click on that and give an overview of some of the common options. Not every option. It's not a, a full uh, documentation site, but just the common options that I find useful on all these and what you would normally be using them for. Um, so this is a follow-up. If, if, after this, if you want to follow up on any of this stuff, this is a good follow-up site, gitref.org. Um, I also wrote ProGit, um, uh, which was published by APRESS, but it's also a Creative Commons license. So the full text is uh, in markdown format on GitHub, and you can read it online at progit.org. Uh, you can also read it in several other languages in English if, uh, if you happen to, to be more comfortable with something else. So this would be the secondary follow-up. So gitref.org is a good way to look at uh, sort of a quick reference for the, the stuff that I'm going over. This would be a, you know something that might take you a couple days to read through, um, but is much more in depth. But it, it is also free and online. Um, and there's like EPUB and stuff that you can put on your Kindle or whatever. Um, that's what it looks like. Okay, and lastly, ish, this is my email address. So if you have a question about Git or about setting up Git or whatever, feel free to email me. Um, put in the subject line with the, the, the name of this conference so that I have some reference as to where I met you um, or, or where the question is coming from. That'd be happy to, to help you out. And that's Twitter. Some people like asking questions on Twitter. Okay, so that's me. So, what is Git? So, real quick, an overview of Git from the sort of 10,000 foot view, right? So, Git's an open source distributed version control system designed for speed and efficiency. Thank you very much. It was nice meeting you guys. Um, it is a version control system. So, if you're using, how many of you have used uh, one of the bottom ones here? CBS? Yeah. Nobody's used Visual Source Safe, right? Because you wouldn't be here because you would have killed yourself. Um, Subversion, so how many of you have used Mercurial or Bazaar? Okay, not that many people. Um, uh, okay. So, Git, it's right about there in the spectrum. Um, it's open source, so you can go online, click on that, get a tarball, look at the source, it's all uh, mostly C now. It, it was a lot of, usually what they'll do is they'll prototype stuff in Perl and then uh, built it, move it over to, to a C built in. Uh, but there is some, some Perl in there now, uh, or still. Um, it's a distributed system, so it's a distributed version control system. So instead of like Subversion or CVS or Perforce or basically any other system uh, that you've probably used, 
where you have the central server with all the versions and you check out one of them and start working on it, and somebody else checks out one of them and starts working on it. Um, instead, everybody has basically the same database that the server has. Right? So there's, there's really nothing on whatever server you're using to collaborate with other people as a, as a central point. Um, it doesn't really have any data that, that everybody that has a checkout and is working on this, the source code has as well. So if you lose the server at any point, basically any other person that has ever cloned the project can put their database on another server and everybody can continue using that. So you don't have the problem of a single point of failure anymore. Um, it's a fully distributed system. So basically every command that you're running in Git, with the exception of push and pull, um, are, it is a local command. It happens locally on your disk. There's no network latency overhead. Um, you don't need to be connected to a network to run it. So that means that Basically, everything's very fast, especially compared to Subversion. Um, basically, every clone is a backup, and generally, you can work offline. So you can do almost anything offline that you can do while you're online. That means off VPN as well if you guys are working in a corporate environment, which is fairly nice. Um, and then when you get online, you can synchronize your work. So that includes performing a diff, viewing file history, committing changes, merging branches, pending other revisions of the file, switching branches. These are all local operations. You do not need a network to, to accomplish any of them. Um, and finally, designed for speed and efficiency, so it is the primary ACM of the Linux kernel, that's what it was designed for, that's what it is still used for, um, and it handles even larger projects than that now. Uh, the Android projects, does anybody have an Android phone? I would assume more people have Android phones than Perl. Uh, conference, so, yes, uh, Android is a huge project, Linux kernel is one sub-project of the Android project, and, uh, and it uses Git for the entire thing. So, if it can handle that, then it can probably handle whatever project you're working on as well. Um, okay, it's also an immutable system, so every time that you're running commands, has anybody using it used the rebase command? Has anybody been burned by the rebase command? Yep. Okay, so what actually happens when you're running stuff, you can rewrite your history in Git, and we'll hopefully get to that if I don't uh, speak too slowly. I'll go over some of the rebase stuff, but um, but you can rewrite your history and get it. It allows you to go back and say, oh, instead of my history looking like this, I want it to look like this. What Git does is it doesn't change your history. It doesn't actually modify your history. What it does is it writes new history, and then it moves a pointer. So the old history is still in your system. It's almost impossible, actually. Once you've committed something in Git, it's very difficult to get it out of Git again. Um, it, it's, it's easy to lose a reference to it, right? but it's, you can always find it again. So no matter what you're doing in Git, it's always just adding data to the system and then moving pointers around. So though you may lose a pointer and have to you know, find some place to put that pointer back, which can be difficult, um, it, it doesn't remove data. It's, always, it's, always an, it's basically an append-only database. Um, and then finally, the way that Git thinks about what it's doing is in terms of snapshots rather than, than file-based patches, right? So in a file-based belt storage system like uh, basically anything, Subversion, CVS, Perforce, even Mercurial, they all think about their content in terms of files, right, as a file-oriented storage system. So if you have a couple of files, readme.txt, hello.c, and you commit them, what it does is it sort of sets up, a, uh, in Mercurial terms, a rev log, right, a log of here's hello.c and here's all the versions of it, and here's readme.txt and here's all the versions of it. And then when you change something, so if I changed hello.c, and committed it again, it would put in some change, right? So it depends on the implementation. Sometimes they keep the last version and have deltas backwards. Sometimes they do like a, like a video uh, encoding system where it does a snapshot every once in a while and deltas in between. It doesn't really matter. The point is that it thinks about it in terms of, this is hello.c and here's all the versions of it, right? And then version A has these, or commit A has these versions of the files, commit B has these versions of the files, and so on and so forth. Now, if I were to rename one, the, the difficulty with the system is, if I were to rename a file and commit it again, then it has to give me a new log with a pointer back so I don't lose the history of that system, right? I have to explicitly say I'm renaming this file. Um, and then if I go in here and change this and do another, and uh, I'm sorry, and copy hello.ola.c to hello.c and commit it again, then I have to store some sort of copy so that it's back in hello.c, but I still have hello.c here and commit you know, points to all of them. And it gets kind of messy if you're doing a lot of renaming and, and copying and stuff. Um, 
Git doesn't do it this way. If I wanted to get the snapshot of commit C, for example, I would have to go through all of these file logs and stitch together what that snapshot looked like at that point in time, right? I'd have to reconstruct it. Git actually uh, thinks about things the opposite of that, where it stores snapshots as a first class uh, system, and then it can reconstruct the deltas after that, right? But the snapshot is actually what it's, it's primarily thinking about. So in Git, if we were to do the same thing, this is how Git would imagine the data, or would think about the data as it's storing it. If you <coughs> add these files and commit them, um, what Git does is it checksums the content of the file and then saves the content in its database under the checksum. And it will do the same thing for hello.c. And so you have this content in your database. And then what it does is it writes a manifest that says, uh, it, it's sort of like a block, are you guys familiar with like POSIX file system stuff? Right, so this is like a POSIX file system. You have content under sort of block pointers, and then you have a manifest that says readme.txt is this, this uh, block pointer, and hello.c is this one, and so it can pull that content back out of the system, and then the commit metadata points to that manifest. And then if I were to change it, then it would add new content in, and add a new manifest where it points, the readme didn't change, so it points back to the, the previous block pointer that it had, you know, the previous checksum that it had. And hello.c did, so it points to the new one. And if I rename this and commit again, it doesn't add any new content because there is no new content, right? No, no content of any files changed. You don't have anything new to add to the system. So you have the same three pieces of content and the same basic manifest. The only difference is that the name of the file changed. So you don't have an explicit rename. What Git does is after the fact, it goes through and it says, between commit B and commit C, yeah. it looks like this file was renamed because it has the same or very similar content. And this and hello.c was removed and hello.c was added. So it's probably a rename, right? It figures it out later by the snapshot. So you don't have to tell it that. Does that make sense? Does this all make sense? So I'm going, okay, yeah. Uh, there's, there's a question related to this. Does that mean that Git can store it in Does it uh, store it um, Yes. It, Initially it is, um, because if you have some huge file and you change one bit in it yeah. and, and commit it again, then you have the, another huge file, right, with one bit change. Um, what it will do when you uh, occasionally will run a, a program called GC, which goes through and it will actually delta compress this data internally, but the, the, the difference between how this does it and how like, Subversion does it is that this does it after the fact, it does it much later in, this, in the process, and it can redo it at any time to be more efficient, to store the data more efficiently. It can even delta compress, it doesn't, it doesn't do it, but it can't generally, but it could delta compress files off of files that are named differently, right? It doesn't have to delta compress hello.c off hello.c, it can delta compress readme off hello.c if it's actually more similar and it can get a better delta compression off of it, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So now, if we were to go in here and we change the content of that and create a copy like we did in the last example, then it has to add new content again because we have new content now. It stores a new snapshot. But one of the interesting things is that since the content of both the hello.c and hello.c are the same, it just has two different files with the same block pointer, right? With the same, it says these two files have exactly the same content, and this is the content that it is. So there's no there's no copying and there's no duplication of data. In fact, this is sort of like a like a hard link in a file system, right? Um, Git can even do this with subdirectories. So if there is a subdirectory, it has the snapshot or, or the uh, checksum of all of the files in that subdirectory. So if you recursively copy a subdirectory and then add and commit that to Git, then it doesn't add any new data into the system. It just says this subdirectory is the same as this one. So it's like hard linking subdirectories that allows you to do that too. Uh, but anyways, so this is how Git thinks about data. So instead of, of this sort of thing, it looks more like this. I think it's a simpler format, but it's easier, I think, to use Git in an effective manner if you understand that what you're doing is you're going through and you're, you're creating